some words I have like a very Somerset accent. I think you can hear it when I say Somerset as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, Take to the streets of London. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm gonna look really cool with my like bright pink helmet and like my knee pads and all of that on, and then my skates are like bright yellow. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Teacher Pod. First of all, let's meet today's guest. Who are you and what do you do? Hi, so I am Miss Collins at Chobham and I teach history, um, but I'm also the head of humanities at Chobham as well. Tell us about your, your background, Miss Collins, sort of where you're from, what your kind of younger years were like, family, etc. Just Just a bit about your background. Um, so I grew up just outside of Bath, which is in down south, um, sort of in between Bath and Bristol in a small town called Midsummer Norton. And um, that's where I grew up with my parents and I've got a younger sister and we always had dogs. So currently we've got sort of two dogs as well. Um, quite an interesting background, actually, because my granddad was actually born in Egypt and then moved over when he was a child. So we've got sort of some mixed heritage there as well. Not that you would know that to look at me, um, but we've got sort of a, a range of sort of family still within Egypt um, linked on my granddad's side. Um, I then went to the University of York after I finished my A-levels to do history and politics and then did my teacher training at Bristol University. So moved back home for a year to do that. Uh, and then I moved to London. Thanks, this is the first time actually in all the years that I've known you, speaking to you now, I've only ever, ever heard your sort of South Western <laughs> come out. Just as you were talking then and you said Bath and I was like, oh my God, I can now hear it, but I didn't know that before. Yeah, I think it's certain words, there's like, some words I have like a very Somerset accent. I think you can hear it when I say Somerset as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the southwestern sort of accent comes through. <laughs> uh, what kind of a student then were you at school? Oh, I mean, I was 100% a goody two-shoes, like never stepped anything wrong. I've got, I got one detention I can remember and it really upset me and it was for something really stupid. Like I didn't get my um, planner signed once. We had to get it signed like by our parents every week. And I can remember going home and being like really upset that I've got this one detention. I was such a teacher's pet. Um, obviously, history was my favourite subject. Um, and then I went on and did history for A-levels as well. But, you know, in terms of me as a student, I was probably like this, this model student that would always get like the pillar points and things. Um, never sort of really stepped a foot out of line, really. Quite boring as a student. <laughs> But now, as a form tutor, what happens when one of your tutees doesn't get their plan assigned? Well, I've got year 13, so it's not quite the same. But when I was a year 7 and 8 tutor, um, I always used to have this sort of like, I'm disappointed in you conversation in the, the back of my mind, sort of telling them this story about the one time I didn't do it. <laughs> they all used to laugh at me, I think, thought I was a bit sad. <laughs> What about before going into education then? What, did you have another job or whether it was part time whilst you were kind of, um, you know, in your younger years of, of your teens, hmm. a, a job you had before being a teacher? Um, well, not, not really. I mean, I did have a part time job because I went straight into teaching from finishing uni. So I didn't really have any sort of gap year or anything like that. Um, but I did work sort of part time in a pub for a few months. Um, my role was amazing. I was in charge of making the desserts, which is always great. Um, so, you know, the end of the shift when there was always leftover cheesecake, or whatever, it was like the little party bag that came home with me. Um, but no, I didn't really have any sort of proper, like other job besides teaching. I really only went into working in the pub for a few months because I was raising money basically, because I was going to Africa for um sort of a month and so i just needed some money to time me over before i started my teaching job so nothing exciting really <laughs> so then that kind of leads me uh, into the next one so why did you get into the world of, of education why why become a teacher 
Um, it was quite a last minute decision for me. I sort of made the decision probably a week before the sort of deadline for the teaching applications of that year shut. Uh, I was pretty set on doing law um, and all through like my uni career, I was pretty set on doing law. I'd applied to law school and, and all of that. Um, and then it, I, I don't really know, like people have asked me this quite a few times or what changed your mind. And it was just, I think I just had this realization a bit like we've had over lockdown that actually for me sitting behind a desk would have been like the worst possible sort of career move. And actually I wanted a career that still felt like it was really meaningful, but actually every day is different and is incredibly rewarding. And it doesn't involve usually sitting behind a screen most of the time. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that's a that's a common theme that you know I'm kind of getting when you're speaking to staff, friends who are mm. teachers. Um, yeah, absolutely didn't sign up for this, but we're here, and uh, yeah, it just makes us value getting into the classroom. Yeah, exactly. Just being able to talk to so many different people on like a daily basis is a real, you know, perk of education. I think and that probably one of the big things that pulled me into it. You know, eventually. So try to step away from all the, all the buzzwords that you get in education, mm. but what does uh, an outstanding, outstanding, outstanding student look like to you? Um, I think a student that, you know, regardless of attainment, I think it not has to be anything to do with sort of grades, but a student who is not afraid to make mistakes and a student that will put themselves out there and even if they're a little bit unsure, is willing to give things a go. Because I think that resilience is so important for just life in general and not being afraid to, you know, be themselves and, and step out if, if they do have, you know, in just in lessons like things to contribute, but just more generally being able to be comfortable in their own skin. And I think you can really see the students who have that confidence. And if they have that confidence in themselves, usually it sort of comes across in their work as well. Um, so I think it kind of starts with the student first, then, you know, it tends to match the sort of attainment and their effort in lesson as well. But I think just a student who is comfortable in their skin really sort of shines out to me as a student who has the potential to go on and be outstanding, just not in, in the classroom, but just in life in general. Would you like to do it? At weekends or evenings and weekends? Um, well, <laughs> pre, currently... Pre and post lockdown. Well, so in the lockdown, I have taken up a couple of new skills. I was determined I wasn't going to waste this, like, third lockdown sort of period. Um, so I have learned to knit and I have currently managed to make a hat with pom-pom included. I was very impressed. Uh, and a snood. So they got their first outing yesterday in the snow. So I was pretty impressed with that. Um, I also managed to sort of coerce my housemate into buying roller skates. So <laughs> we are attempting roller skating, but when I say attempting, I can currently stand up, go just about maybe 10 yards forward without falling over to the next pillar. I currently haven't left the car park underneath my block of flats, so we're just literally going around in circles. Um, so when we get a little bit better, we will. Um, sort of go outside uh, when the snow melts as well <laughs> take to the streets of london yeah exactly i mean i'm gonna look really cool with my like bright pink helmet and like my knee pads and all of that on and then my skates are like bright yellow so i'm gonna look really cool but you know you've got to do these things properly um and then obviously outside of lockdown i really enjoy doing sort of things that are quite active um, so I did the marathon a couple of years ago and currently I'm doing a virtual challenge because that's you know the best you can do at the moment um, so I've signed up to basically doing a virtual walk around Egypt where you kind of track it on your phone it's really cool you sort of track it and every time you like do exercise where it's like running walking whatever in theory skating when I get that good um, you log it on your app and then it like you can virtually track yourself on the map and then they send you sort of postcards and things um, which is obviously the best that I can do at the moment when you're not allowed to travel. <laughs> Who inspires you and why? Um, sure, I think that's really hard I was trying to think about this ahead of 
sort of this discussion and I can't pinpoint sort of one person. I think it depends on sort of like certain aspects. So like in terms of like who inspired me to go into teaching um, and who like inspired me to sort of move to London, sort of trying to think about the big decisions that I've made in my life. And that's probably, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, sort of came from my mum, like she's in education as well. Um, and both my parents were incredibly supportive of me sort of moving to London. Um, but then some of the other sort of big things I've done in my life, such as um, when I was at uni, I climbed uh, Kilimanjaro for charity. I had a really sort of inspirational um, lecturer there who was also part of this sort of programme. And so that's kind of how I got involved in that element of it. So sort of thinking about the big things I've done, it, it kind of comes from different people. Um, but you know, my parents are certainly a core motivator for sort of everything I do, and they're always really supportive of everything. Uh, but then there's lots of things I've done in my life where I sort of try and motivate myself to do, um, and I sort of <laughs> see myself as the person that's forcing other people to do these things because I really want to do them. And sort of things like doing the marathon, and a couple of years ago we did Everest Base Camp, and those are all sort of things that I pushed on my housemate so I think it's sort of taking that inspiration from a few sort of key people in my life and then sort of I'm pushing it on other people because I want to keep going. <laughs> so you've been at Chobham Academy now for quite a few years um you know yeah. furniture they say if you get over sort of three years three or four years um but what would you say is your favorite thing then about Chobham Academy? Oh 100% the students I was really quite nervous when I first came to London to teach. Um, it was just past my teacher training year, so I was, you know, 21. It was a big change for me to move to London anyway. And I was really quite nervous at starting in any sort of school in London. Um, but almost instantly, the kids at Chobham are just absolutely amazing. And the kids that started with me in year seven, are now a lot of them still with us in year 12 and some of them I have taught in history from year seven all the way through to year 12 now and the relationship that you can build with the students at Chobham is just amazing um, but then obviously the staff body there as well is, is you know you can't fault it the humanities department and everybody there uh, you always feel so supported and there's such just a good team of you know friends as well not just colleagues um, and that's what I love about Chobham. You always feel welcome. You always feel supported. It's just such a lovely environment to be around because of the students and the staff, which is, you know, you can't ask for anything else when you come to work, really. No, it's a lovely, lovely answer um, and, a, and a really sort of popular one as well. A lot of people saying mm. Chobham are just, you know, brilliant and the staff make, you know, make going to work like an enjoyable thing. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Okay, last question. If you could go back to a 15 year old Amelia Collins, what one piece of advice would you give her and why? My one regret so far, and I wish someone had told me to do this when I was, you know, 15, is to take a gap year and go traveling either sort of before you go to uni or just after and you start a job. And I really wish that's something I had the confidence to do. Um, not when I was 15, but certainly starting to think about it when I was in my teens. Um, and I really wish that's something that I had taken up and done before, the, you know, the complexities of life start to kick in and it becomes more difficult to do these things. Um, so I would, my advice to my 15 year old self would be don't, don't rush about getting into like a career, enjoy yourself while you are, you know, a young adult, go and see the world, don't be afraid to leave london don't be afraid to leave england and actually just put yourself out there and have these experiences um it's something that's still on my list and i think when i eventually decide to leave london i will probably go for a year abroad before i move back to um, bath which is my sort of end goal um in sort of five ten years time so that would be my advice do it what you can before you get tied down with things and a lovely way to finish. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs>
Uh, hopefully no see, you, see you in person soon, bossing the third floor. And uh, yeah, hopefully the rest of lockdown is, is all right for you. And carry on. Yes, hopefully. <laughs> all right. Thanks very much.